Welcome to Working Lunch, the Slow Chambers weekly series where we take some time to talk with our community leaders and help you connect to some of the exciting things happening in our region. I'm Jim D'Antona, President and CEO of the Slow Chamber, and today you'll get to be a part of my conversation with our 2021 board chair and the general manager of SEMS and Company Builders, Jessica Steely. SEMS and Company Builders have been constructing unique and creatively styled environmentally friendly custom homes and remodels on the Central Coast since 1978 and continues to be recognized as a leading innovator of alternative energy and sustainable building practices. Together with our community part with other community partners such as Slow Green Build and the California Straw Builders Association, SEMS and Company works to raise awareness of green building practices and provide the latest and most cost-effective green building solutions. Today I'm excited to talk with Jessica about her roots. What inspires her to give so much to our community? And of course, learn more about the amazing creative work that she and the team at SEMS do across the Central Coast. Jessica, thank you so much for being here. Hi, thank you for having me today. It's very exciting to be part of this. Um, how many have you done? What number am I for this working lunch? Uh, you are, I think, 43. We've been doing 43. this. 43. Oh, close. 44 is my favorite number. So, you know, pretty close. I'll count it. That is awesome. Yeah, it's been, uh, you know, I, it's shocking to think it's been 43 episodes, of, but it's been so enjoyable to talk with folks and getting connected and getting folks to know a little bit more about their community, like with folks like you. Well, thanks. And I have to say, those are some great jams there in the intro slide. I'm going to have to go find that. It's good to like background work music. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you have, I don't, you have to look up didgeridoo or whatever that was <laughs> that would happen to be playing there. <laughs> um, so kind of as we first get started, first and foremost, where are you zooming in from today? So we uh, have our office in Atascadero, and that's where I am Zooming from. We've actually been in this building for 20 plus years, and we're moving next month. Um, not far, though, just across the street, but I spend the most number of waking hours in this room, so it's going to be kind of odd to shift my experience, but, you know, new beginnings. I'm ready. Well, it's, uh, that sounds exciting and challenging, right? Trying to move, trying to do all that. Luckily, you probably know a few people in the, in the industry who can help you make, make your space uh, fit better for your new work, right? Yeah, no doubt. Well, I'd love to start from the beginning and you maybe tell us a little bit about where you grew up and maybe how you first came to Slow County. Yeah, okay. Um, that's fun to share. I grew up in a little town called Arnold. It's kind of um, on a map halfway between Tahoe and Yosemite, so pretty rural. One road in, one road out, lots of snow in the winter. Everybody knows everybody's business. And, um, and then I ended up coming to Cal Poly, and, um, and, and it's, it's nice. It's a good fit because it's still small enough, San Luis Obispo County and San Luis City proper, where you can meet new people at a small dinner party, but yet you can't go to the grocery mart without running into someone you know. So I think that's a nice balance for me. But yeah, my little town, um, multi-generations, we were there. And yeah, I think that's where I got my appreciation for nature itself and wanting to protect it. So maybe tell us, because it sounds like there might have been some similarities in terms of a small town of slow, but I'm sure Arnold was even smaller because I don't think I've heard of Arnold. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are your first impressions of slow and how those have either proven to be true or evolved over time? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I was, uh, when I first came here, it was a little culture shock because you know, I had spent times in other communities, but, you know, it was a much larger place than where I had come from originally. And yeah, I, I liked San Luis. Um, I plugged in pretty quickly in regard to the community at large outside of Cal Poly. And I liked how the community really paid a lot of attention to their open space and what a priority that was balanced with the community and economic development piece. So that's something I noticed pretty early on. And I think Really, I mean, I respect that. I respect that intention. So that's one of the, the reasons I fell in love with the area, of course, and it's gorgeous and the weather's killer. Yeah, not bad Less at all. snow than Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that could be a good thing. Um, so tell me a little bit about when you went to Cal Poly, 
uh, did you, were you interested in your kind of current field of work or did you sign up to do something else? Uh, it, it's been an interesting plug over the last kind of conversations we've had on Working Lunch to see where people started out and where they ended up. Yeah, I'd say my path has been relatively linear, which I'm grateful for. I mean, honestly, I, I literally do what I went to school for. So I started in, uh, let's say high school, I loved my drafting class and it was like before AutoCAD. So a while back, uh, we still, we had like the old fashioned ammonia based blueprint machines which was interesting, but anyhow, so I thought I wanted to be an architect. So I applied to Cal Poly. Thank goodness I got in because that was the, where I was headed and um, only applied to that one school. So I got in under architecture and after about a year and a half, I realized that I like, I am a better fit in the big picture organizational, more tangible kind of a pragmatic black and white while still being able to be the leader that I want to be with bringing everyone together to achieve a common goal. So I transitioned into construction management and minored in sustainable environments, which was just absolutely perfect for me because I was able to kind of combine all the things I really loved. Yeah. So it's uh, one of those I don't know if I'm the minority that went to do what I studied, you know, I ended up doing in my career, but um, like I said, my path's been pretty linear. That's fabulous. So that actually sounds great and kind of takes us to that next step where after, you know, Cal Poly, uh, you came to SEM, what first drew you to the company and was there like a specific project or an interaction that kind of piqued your interest? That's a funny story, Jim, actually. When I was uh, close to graduating, I don't know, maybe two or three quarters before I was officially done, I made a list of the 10 things that I wanted when I graduated. What, who do I want to work with? Who do I, because it's, you know, we have this paradigm in our mind that who's going to hire me, who's going to hire me. And instead I really approached it with mentorship from some of my instructors about who do I want to give my energy toward? What do I, how do I want to influence myself in my next step in my career? So I made a list of 10 priorities and then I sought out an organization that fit almost, actually they ended up fitting all of them. And that was SEMS and Co. And I approached them, us, and they weren't hiring. And um, in some ways I would encourage young people to do that because you end up not having to compete <laughs> you just convince the people that you're going to fit in and work out that your values are aligned, that you're going to really work hard to make it happen. And uh, that's what I did. And really, it was about SEMS's values. So there are, you know, at Cal Poly Construction Management, it's an outstanding program. You have a lot of opportunity given to you in whatever field you want to end up pursuing, whether it's civil construction or conventional multifamily homes, whatever it is. And for me, I wanted to work with a company that was going to continue to shift the paradigm, change the ideals. What is next out there? I don't want to just put together sticks and, and drywall because that's the way it's always been done. I want to continue to innovate. And that was what SEMS really brought to the table that I was really excited about. Well, it seems there's a common theme here. You applied to one school, you got into it. You applied <laughs> to one company, you got into it. Um, I guess what, what Jessica sets her mind to, it just kind of is going to happen. So awesome. Very Yeah, cool. what's next? Whew. Yeah, exactly. Can't <laughs> wait to see your list of one thing. Um, <laughs> but now, so obviously you, you jumped into the company when did you know that you, was it back in college? Was it here that you wanted, you knew that you wanted to leave the company and how did that transition happen? Oh yeah. So, <laughs> so when I, they hired me, I gave them a five-year commitment. I said, I will stay for five years. Uh, that was about 18 years ago, but anyhow, um, I said, I'd stay for five. And when, so that was 2004. So I guess that's 17 years. Um, when I, so I started, I was doing project management for our residential, you know, uh, beautiful, custom, environmentally progressive homes. 
And the founder, Turco Sems, who really is the, the ultimate innovator, he's so charismatic, he's such a progressive leader, and he brought us all together, ultimately. All of the staff here, we have the same values, we, we believe in what we do, and he was ready to retire. So he asked what employees were interested in buying his business. And at the end of the day, it was me and uh, two of my partners, Paul Rose and Tom Moore, and we'd already been working together for, uh, I guess it was seven years when we actually ended up closing the deal, which was in 2011. And yeah, so it was really kind of at that moment where it was like, of course, I love this organization. It has proven to be incredibly fruitful and nurturing and, um, you know, having a walk the talk on all the values that I was initially impressed by. And yeah, so then it was funny. And I started, I said, I wanted to stay in project management because I really love guiding the team toward that final goal. And it was kind of funny. I'll never forget this day. Uh, so I originally said I wanted, I'll be your CFO and I want to continue to be project manager. So um, we kept trying to hire salespeople to come in and represent the front end and, and bring our customers in. And I'll tell you about kind of our process in a minute. But um, after, I, I want to say it was two years, uh, we were at Michael Gunther's office, collaborations, and <laughs> they put me in the hot seat and they said, you just have to take the job. You got to be, you got to end up taking the front end. And we also want you to take on the full general management too. And I think that was probably 2013. And I went home and I definitely had a second glass of wine that night. But <laughs> so um, it was, I remember that moment where it was like, okay, you, you've got to take this on and be the leader. And it was really great to know that um, my my team had that much faith in me that they were never second guessed the idea and they were really just giving me time to get used to the idea. And I was absolutely outside my comfort zone. And so it was pretty great. I reached out to a lot of resources and I started visiting a, a life coach, someone that can really help you approach to make sure you're kind of maintaining that appropriate life balance, work-life balance. So that was really good for me. I took sales classes. I mean, I already knew a lot about construction, so that wasn't really a big deal, but it was kind of, kind of a, you know, I was always a great teammate, but to be the captain was a transition. But now that's been oh, eight years ago, and I'm pretty comfortable and loving what I'm doing. So that, it's it's such an inspiring story, and to see you know that it obviously wasn't the intention when you started, but to drive all the way to where you're at. You talked about the values uh, that the company you know walked. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about because I was so impressed to hear kind of the techniques and the processes you use. Uh, to your work. So can you talk about maybe some of those signature techniques and approaches you use? Uh, yeah, thanks for, I'm glad because I really wanted to get that in there a little bit. One of the things that I love about SEMS is that our model is structured around involvement from day one. So whether the, a lot of our clients don't even have property yet and they say, help us find a parcel that's going to be easy to build on. In other words, um, for us, there's some simple basics around design and that's passive solar, which I won't go too deep into, but basically it's um, in North County, for example, try not to put a ton of windows on the west side of the building. Simple things like that, because you're going to have a greenhouse in the summer. Um, so passive solar design, which is, I'll just say, uh, it's orientation, insulation, ventilation, and mass. And it was really funny. So Turco Sems, the founder, um, he used to see in this little dance, orientation, insulation, ventilation, mass. And it's just, um, he's a passive solar fanatic. But uh, my point being is that in regard to picking the right parcel, do we have south facing views? Are we really gonna be kind of stuck with that west facing structure that's gonna, we're gonna be combating that heat in the summer. So little things like that and being able to consult both on sustainability and cost. And I guess I would say just all around constructability. So we play that role throughout the whole design phase, whether the architect is in-house where we have our design build solution and, uh, or we work with another architect in the community. It's that team approach that really allows us to vet the client's ideas early on so that we don't end up with these 
oh, I wish I would have thought about or pursued the idea of once the home is under construction, because obviously that's a more expensive time to kind of explore solutions versus having them in the initial plan all the way through. We also find that people, we can set a budget early on and just stay true to that budget through the design phase as we pick materials and things. So, well, so that's pretty fun, but yeah. Well, I was going to say you're, you know, you were talking a little bit about there about kind of the West, the green, not creating a greenhouse in Paso. And I think you mentioned before that you can almost build it in such a way that you don't even need AC in Paso. And I, I don't even know what that means. Uh, is that possible? Can people do yeah, that? Yeah, we have. <laughs> I, <laughs> thank you, Jim. Uh, that's one of my favorite stories to tell people is that we will build a beautiful high-end custom home in North County and it doesn't need air conditioning. It does mean that you in the summer open your windows at night, let the building cool down. We have that impressive diurnal swing so that we can really maximize that effectiveness in the custom home and yeah, no AC needed. So it's pretty great. That's pretty shocking. Uh, so congrats on however you're doing that. Um, and with all your design and uh, the pieces you're putting together. Is there a particular building technique right now that's trending or, or techniques your clients are showing an increased interest in? Sure. The history was that we were known as the straw bale builder and we did a lot of straw bales. In the 17 years I've been here, I've probably done maybe 12. So, and they were really popular when I had first started here. And over the years, we see the demand for that kind of aesthetic is waning because it ends up being a thick wall, a little bit more organic looking because the walls aren't, you know, rigidly straight. They're literally made of straw. And uh, that's very fascinating. You can go to my website and learn more about that if you're interested. But um, these days we're seeing a great demand around building with earth. So rammed earth is the most common way we've seen that happen. And um, we've been doing it for decades and it's kind of novel that it's picking up in popularity right now because it's something we're, we're very good at and um, it's really fun to do. And back to my um, orientation, insulation, ventilation mass, it's that mass piece of this wall that essentially acts as a flywheel to really kind of um, normalize the extreme temperatures. And again, make it so that you don't need the air conditioning or you need less heat in the winter because you have all this mass that really slowly migrates the temperature one way or the other. So yeah, ram earth is fun. I would say the other thing that's happening right now that I find quite innovative and novel, again, in that planning phase is that we're able to take a three-dimensional or a digital model, I should say, which is what we see more now than the old school foam core cutouts. And those, um, we've got a uh, alternate reality goggles that you put on and we can go to the site and we can put you inside that model at an actual appropriate scale. So you can see what the views are going to be like out your future bedroom window or your kitchen window and really say, oh, well, gosh, you know, let's move it six feet over the window or the door so we can capture additional views that we might not otherwise have known to do until we saw the building framed up and there could have been additional challenges with relocating openings and things. So it's just another way um, to really help people get excited and most of our clients have never built before. And so it's not easy for everyone to visualize a three-dimensional space off of a set of plans. So that's just one more tool that we use. That's so cool. And it's, it's interesting to me because it sounds like in, in your building pieces that talking about that rammed earth, it feels very, um, again, going back to the Pueblos, like the like very old school. And yet then you put on alternate reality goggles and figure out how to work. So you've somehow blended uh, old school and new school. That's incredible. You nailed it. It's that vernacular architectural techniques that were tried and true for 
centuries, right? Before technology became, it is just like they built of the materials they had and the materials that work most effectively. And so to learn from our ancestors that way for our specific climate area, and then mix in the fancy radiant heated slab and, you know, all electric induction cooktops and things like that. So it's a fun blend. You're right. Yeah, best of best of both worlds in that way. That's fabulous. So I let a little bit of a transition here to, you know, obviously when I joined a few years ago at the Slow Chamber, you were already part of the board. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you first got involved with the chamber or maybe even like community service and leadership in general? I think I'm addicted to community service. <laughs> Uh, so I first came to San Luis, I was in the red bricks for the architectural college and I was the enriched director. So I was on our little student council for the dorms and my job was to rally all the um, <clears throat> perhaps slightly sleepy, maybe hungover uh, freshman college kids to go out. Not saying that anyone did that, but um, to go out and plant trees and clean up the beaches and things here in San Luis Obispo. And that was one of the first ways that I was able to connect with our community leaders in other organizations outside of the bubble that is Cal Poly. So many of the students, we just didn't get out of that immediate environment for maybe two or three years. And then you start to, you know, experience the community outside of um, Higuera Street. And <laughs> And uh, yeah, so that was the beginning. And then, um, yeah, Slow Green Build was an organization that was uh, the first board I was ever chair of. And that was, I went back and looked and that was 10 years ago, which is just kind of wild to think about. But I did a lot of volunteering with them. And then with the chamber, I first started working with the chamber because uh, first of all, I do love a good networking opportunity. So the mixers were probably the first reason I ever touched base with the, the chamber directly. But I worked with the EVC building design and construction cluster and they collaborated with the chamber and the Home Builders Association to do their housing coalition. And that was really where I started to plug in and make deeper relationships with the chamber and appreciate the level of professionalism there. And then, um, yeah, I joined the board about five years ago. And um, yeah, and then it was, I have to just admit to you, it's been really wonderful to participate in that bridging the gap between Old Guard and New Guard with Ermina. And knowing that most of our staff remain the same was really helpful as well so we bridged that but um it's been a pleasure to be part of the transition well and you you know you uh you this year and hillary trout for last year are in a very interesting time to be uh you know leading chambers uh during these terrific pandemic days um you know as you were starting to maybe see some light at the end of the tunnel here uh, what are some of maybe your hopes for the chamber or overall regional economy here in the near future? You know, everything to get back to normal and we all just have great net profits. No big deal. We can hang out together, spend time together, help each other envision better tomorrows. Uh, but really on a more <laughs> pragmatic level, it's reconnecting the business and organizational leaders. I think we've We've done our part staying connected through Zoom, but um, to, to just reopen those really candid and sincere lines of communication, to know that we're all in this together. I think that that's, you know, like kind of um, emerging from our cocoon and we're gonna be, um, you know, we're safe together. And I think that's really important. I think that working with the city itself and then also the county to do that. And I know that that's something that we're working on with the chamber that really makes me feel good because honestly, what I love about the organization, this one and, and the, two handfuls of others that I can't stop volunteering for. Uh, the it's, it's about our collective voice being valued on a bigger scale and knowing that our decision makers really do want the community's opinion and the organizations like the chamber that have this credibility that we can bring to the board of supervisors or city council or city and and our voice is heard. And that is 
makes me not feel like I'm wasting my time. Um, but it's like being surrounded with other people that are willing to give their time toward this healthy tomorrow. And that I think is just wonderful. And then I also am pretty excited that we have the tri counties coalition of chambers that you're on Jim, which is helping give us a voice little San Louis a voice on a state and wider level. And I think that's also just outstanding because we saw when we were trying to lobby through this tough time with the with the folks in Sacramento and us kind of not have our voice heard. And so the fact that we're working to make that happen is just really, really empowering. And additionally, I'd say that um, we're doing a lot of good work already for our members, such as the buy local bonus program, which I just, you know, that's a direct way to what we were at like half a million dollars worth of sales receipts or something just under that. But I mean, that's amazing to say, hey, folks, buy local and we'll kick you back. And then um, also the grant money that we distributed, another half a million dollars, I think, in that neighborhood to local businesses. And, you know, that's just directly serving our membership. And I'm, I'm just really pleased that we're doing that kind of work and to continue making that happen. So I'm excited. And I think that, yeah, connectivity is probably outside of these outstanding programs is our, is our biggest um, goal so that we're in our trusted circles again. Well, I agree. And I, again, so thankful for kind of your leadership on the board and the board's work uh, to try and again, mirror that, that we just got to bring our community back because in slow, right, the connections are so key uh, to making uh, our economy work and getting everybody back, uh, moving in the right direction. So I, I just want to kind of, as we get near the end here, I, you know, you, we talked a lot about the work that SEMS does and your thoughts and the values of the company. Is there one thing you wish people knew about kind of living and building sustainably? Well, I have a belief that one of my highest values is about personal responsibility. Everything that you do matters. You're the one that's responsible for each and every action. So whether it's little things like recycling or composting, um, it's all the actions that add up. And you don't have to build a decadent, high-end, cutting-edge, progressive green custom home to to live a sustainable life. Uh, my little house is darling and quaint and we compost and we collect our rainwater and we use our gray water to water our blackberries. And, you know, there's all sorts of things that you can do every day that can feel amazing because you, you're part of that future. You're, uh, I like to, I was joking about my sister, Lauren, she made a, a comment the other day about what is my 80 year old self need? And um, her, her comment was around um, 80 year old self needs uh, 30 or 40 year old self, whatever your age is, uh, to floss your teeth. And I thought that was the funniest thing, um, but it's also about protecting our environment and our community. And it's about, yeah, taking those steps each day to be responsible for all of your actions. And sustainability uh, means a little something different to everyone, but to consider it in each decision. Uh, that is uh, fabulous. And I'm, I mean, I, that's such a perfect way to kind of end this conversation for all the folks listening and watching and all of us can do something um, and all of it counts in the end towards that bigger goal. That's fabulous. So if anyone's interested in learning more about SEMS, where should they go? Oh, you should check out our website. You can find us at SEMSCO.com or search Slow Green Builder and you'll find us. And uh, we're actually, I think, maybe a couple weeks away from launching a new website. So if you go today... You might check us out again next month and see our new fancy website where uh, we haven't been keeping up on our portfolio knowing that we were going to launch this website. So there's a, another good handful of uh, custom homes that are going to be on our new website. Oh, cool. So be able to see some of the fun work you guys are working on. That's yeah. awesome. So we always end on one with one question. We'd love to know from you. What are you looking forward to this weekend? I'm going to play in my garden. 
It's uh, really fun. I am definitely, that was my, my uh, PPP takeaway, or sorry, my um, not PPP, which is great. Thank you, government in that front. Um, but no, my uh, COVID takeaway is just spending more time at home in my yard and in my garden and not having to go somewhere all the time. I'm also going to, um, Becky Zielinski through Cal Poly is doing a um, a little workshop from 10 to 11 on Saturday about sowing seeds. And I'm going to check that out too. Well, that actually, that sounds like a blast and uh, a nice way to do something around the house and still, uh, still have some fun. That's so great. Yeah. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for spending time. This was really fun. I uh, really enjoyed the conversation and thanks for talking to us about kind of what's happening in, in the community here. Well, thanks for having me, Jim. It is my pleasure. Well, for all of you eating lunch with us, thank you so much for that. Thank, join us next week where we'll be talking with uh, Libby Agron, who is leading the Slow Wine History Project. If you have questions for Jessica, our guest here, feel free to add them in the Facebook comments below. And maybe she'll get a chance a little later to try and answer some when they get a moment. We appreciate everyone for tuning in. Have a wonderful weekend and stay healthy and safe out there.